All right, well, here we are. Time to get going. It's just so good. Just a couple of uh, things. Well, maybe I should wait. It's a beautiful cold day in Des Moines today. That's good. Glad we don't live up north where we get more snow. We don't say the S word. No four letter words here. Yeah. <laughs> snowy. Right. Snowy. Oh, good. Well, it's good. It's just been fun this morning. You know, we've had folks coming in early, and that's neat. And we get a chance to fellowship and love on each other just a little bit. So, I got several things in my mind. I'm sorry I, I sound a little rambly this morning, but I just got several things running through my mind and um, things that I hadn't planned to say and just kind of wondering when to say them. So, we might just uh, wait just a few minutes. So, an announcement for tonight. So, there's no prayer service here tonight. Instead, since it's the fifth Sunday, we're going to meet over at Pleasant Hill Free Church. Um, you know what? That's what I forgot. So if you're interested in going to the hymn sing tonight at Pleasant Hill Free Church, get with me afterwards and I'll give you the address because I left it on my desk. So, But we always, every month or every time we have a fifth Sunday we try to do this several of our uh, east side churches and uh, it's just gotten to be a fun time uh, where we actually recognize people from other churches and um, it's just good to have that fellowship it was interesting you know last week or last time we had it here and uh, pastor lyle gave just a great testimony uh, just about the the encouragement that he received himself from just having all of us as different churches coming together. And it was a, it was a very moving uh, testimony. And so we're going to be at his church tonight. And so I just encourage you to go. And it's not at 6.30, it's at 6. So I know we do everything at 6.30, but this isn't here. So we're going to be at 6 out at Pleasant Hill Free Church. So then we'll have regular um, service Wednesday night at 6.30 and then men's Bible study at 12.30 on Thursday. And uh, those are pretty much our announcements for today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, it's so good to be in your presence. It's so good to be together. Lord, so many times this morning I've heard just of uh, people needing to be in your presence today. Lord, we thank you that we can come, that we're able to be together. We give you thanks, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's sing a little bit and uh, worship the Lord with music and uh, just have a good time with the Lord this morning. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like Him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. 
Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark that his love can't cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Because Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Did e'er a saint find his friend forsake him? No, not one. No, not one. Or sinner find that he would not take him? No, not one. No, not one. Because Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one, because Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. 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 I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness Your goodness is running after It's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. 
All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness Lord your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Lord, we do sing of your goodness Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands and feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still
darkest days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god let's sing oh praise his name oh praise the name of the lord our god oh praise his name sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God, oh praise the our God. Great is our God. Oh, we thank you. Mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's always good to give praise to Him. You'll have to pardon my nose today. I made pickles yesterday. Cut up a bunch of jalapenos to go in there, right? Oh, yeah. oh. And uh, I'm still suffering from it. That's all right. <laughs> God is good. God is good. <laughs> yeah. So last Sunday we talked about uh, what time is it? Just really looking at, you know, we've had a lot of current events, you know, Israel, the attack on Israel, and and just war everywhere, you know, not just there, you know. Then with the surprise Category Five hurricane that hit Acapulco, you know, that materialized overnight. They were expecting rain and ended up with complete devastation. And we see things like this happen. You know, I've told you before that on my weather app, 
I can zoom it out and I can see all these little red spots of all the earthquakes around the world every single day. Every single day. And the Lord says that these things are going to come. These things are going to happen before his, his return. And he tells us not to be anxious about it. It's just what has to happen. And he used a similar analogy to one that I used, talking about the fig tree. And he told the people listening to him, he says, you know, you look at the leaves on the fig tree, and when the fig tree starts to blossom, you know that summer is near. We talked about the coloring of the trees and, and the foliage and how it starts getting chilly and we start seeing the leaves fall and we know that winter is coming. We don't know when. We don't know how bad. We don't know what it's going to be like. But you can be sure if you live where we live, winter is coming. It's coming. We argue about how hot it's, how warm it's going to be, how cold it's going to be, how much snow we're going to get. But nobody argues about whether it's coming or not. Nobody. And so Jesus challenges his hearers to understand the times as well as we understand the weather. Because we can see, in fact, he was amazed. He says, I'm amazed that you understand the times and the seasons, but you don't understand the time, or you understand the seasons and how they change, but you don't understand the times. And he challenges us to understand the times. You know, the disciples didn't know when these things would happen, and it's been a long time we talked about this. I'm not going to re-preach the message, but we talked about just how the disciples didn't understand it either about what the times. They really expected many of these things to start at any time. But by the time you get to the end of the New Testament, you see after many decades, they understand this idea that God's time is not our time. And one of the verses we ended with was this one in Ephesians where Paul says this, and this is the plan. At the right time, He, God, will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth at the right time. At the right time. And so we concluded this Last week with this, in what we think is uncertainty, we wonder, God, what's going to happen with Israel and the nations around and all these rumors? And yet we hear Jesus, his voice echo in Matthew chapter 24. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Are we going to be involved? Who's going to be involved? What's going to happen? When's it all going to go down? And yet we see in Scripture there are many clear indications of things that need to happen. But we see in what we think is uncertainty, God is perfect order. He's not out of control. There's nothing that takes Him by surprise. The hurricane in Mexico didn't take him by surprise. Even though it took everybody else by surprise. The attack on Israel did not take God by surprise. Even though it took everybody else by surprise. I'm always amazed at how quickly COVID changed our lives. But God was not surprised. God is perfect timeliness. It's at the right time. Peter tells us, he says, you know, we wonder, oh, Jesus, why haven't you returned yet? And he says, God isn't untimely. His time is different than our time. His time is not untimely. It is timely. It's at the right time every time. 
God is perfect peace. Jesus doesn't want us to be anxious about the times. Because God holds these things. God orchestrates these things for His perfect plan. And so He says, you, you need to trust Me. Rest in Me. It doesn't mean we aren't ever concerned. There's a difference. You know, my heart grieves for what's happening over in Israel. My heart grieves for what's going on in Acapulco and, and other places around the world when disasters strike. But we can still be at rest and peace in Him because then we can hear Him and listen. So Diane and I had only been married for a couple of years, it seems. I don't remember the exact year this was, but it hadn't been very long. And my dad and I had a rare opportunity. It was rare, number one, because I was a relatively new believer. He'd been a pastor all my life. And we had an opportunity to minister together at a men's retreat out in Chico Hot Springs, Montana. We were talking about this this morning because Heather used to be there. Chico Hot Springs, Montana. And it's just about a few miles north of Yellowstone. And he was going to be the speaker. I was going to be the worship leader. And uh, it was about a 24-hour drive. 20-hour drive. It was a long drive kind of grueling, and we travel in a van with several other men that we picked up along the way. And it was a great time, but from the time we got in the van to go, I just, something was off, something was wrong. I couldn't put my finger on it. My stomach was just a little upset. You know, and I still could have a good time and do what I needed to do, but I wasn't very hungry, and if you know me, that's really highly unusual. I can usually eat anything at any time. Now it's more problematic as I get older because it wants to hang around a little longer. But <laughs> So even at this banquet that we had you know, with all these men, um, the banquet the night before we left, I, I couldn't eat. I just couldn't. But you know what? When we got in the van to come home, I was fine. Everything was good. Made it home. And when I got home, I'm relaying this to Diana, and I find out that she had the same symptoms that I had while I was gone. And we realized that for the first time in our lives, we were homesick. We were homesick for each other. I'd never been homesick in my life. In fact, you know what? I remember kids getting homesick at camp and people getting homesick. And I thought, what? Why are you homesick? I mean, I'm happy to get away from home, right? I never could understand this homesickness, why people got homesick. I suppose. But Diane and I had never even been apart since we'd been married for not even one day. All of a sudden, physically, we felt it. You know, it's happened other times since then. You know, when we're separated by travel, we still experience some of that same thing. And so as we think today, we're going to take one more day talking about Christ's return. As we think again about the times of Jesus' return, for those that love Him, it brings up a longing in our hearts to see Him. So the title of our message today is Homesick. So you ever been homesick? Yeah. It's an interesting uh, malady, I guess. 
You know, so here's the, here's the thing that I've come away with when I think about those kids at camp that were homesick. You have to love home more than you love where you are. I'll say that again. You have to love home more than when you, where you are. And you start getting homesick. It's the longing to be somewhere else. We see this in Scripture. There's a lot. And part of the reason is because of this, that Jesus is preparing a place for us, He says. He told the disciples in John 14, He says, I'm going away. I'm going away and I'm going to be preparing a place for you so that where I am, you can be there too. He says, my Father's place is massive. And there's plenty of room for you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so look at what he says here. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to go prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. <laughs> you know, there are many reasons people want to go to heaven. I suppose in my own life, when I first came to Jesus... There were reasons that I wanted to go to heaven, and I think over the years, some of those have changed. You know, when you first come to Jesus, sometimes you want to go to heaven so you don't go to hell, right? Many people come to Jesus just for that reason, because they're terrified of eternal punishment that never ends. That's why many people deny its existence. They're happy to acknowledge that heaven exists, but not so much that hell exists. Sometimes we just want to go to heaven because it's better than where we are. Right? Sometimes we want to go to heaven to see loved ones that have passed before us that were followers of Jesus. Sometimes it's because we've invested our treasures there. You know, Jesus said this. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. I'll just stop there for just a second. You know, I love cars. My wife and I, we love going to car shows. And I've had some neat cars. But you know, as I've grown closer to Jesus, I still appreciate the cars. I still see them. We still spot them going down the road. Oh, look at that. You know, we watch old TV shows, and, and most of the time on the old TV shows, even the old 30s and 40s movies, you know, we're looking at the cars. Oh, that's this, that's this. But as I've come closer to Jesus, I don't own any of those treasures anymore. Because my treasure is in heaven. So he goes on to say, Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. And Jesus is saying sometimes we don't want to go to heaven because all of our treasures are here. Jesus reminds His listeners, I mean, they knew the story about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and Abraham, and if you aren't familiar with those stories, you can go back to the book of Genesis and read them. But Lot's, Lot and his family were being pulled out of Sodom before it was destroyed. 
And they were told, don't look back. Don't look back. And Lot's wife looked back. Turned into a pillar of salt. That's where her treasure was. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Paul tells Timothy this in 2 Timothy. He says, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Look at Paul saying, this is the end of his life. He knows, in fact, in the latter part of this letter, he tells Timothy, I'm going to die. Writing's on the wall. This is the last letter you're going to get from me, Tim. And he says, but there's laid up for me this crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. That's us. Crown of righteousness. Treasures in heaven. Sometimes all the above don't really matter anymore. We just want to see Jesus and our Heavenly Father. When our heart's longing turns there, when our eyes are fixed on Jesus and our longing is for Him, the, old, the song says, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. So another point here is that lovers of Jesus want to be with Him. You know, when I was at the men's retreat, I was doing what I needed to do. I was having a good time. But I didn't want to be there, really. My heart wanted to be somewhere else. I'll just take this We'll just do a little commercial break here and congratulate Troy and Heather on their fourth anniversary. It's today. You be a good husband. Lovers of Jesus want to be with Him. Look here. Paul says this to Philippians. He says, For to me, living means living for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go to be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. It says, my longing I know i got work to do here, and there's still work to do, and I know I need to do that work. It's better for you if I stay, but my heart is there. That's my longing. Paul is talking to the church in Thessalonica, which is still there today, not the church, but the city. Um, it's referred to as Thessaloniki. Um, over there in Greece. And he's talking to that church, and he's talking about their faithfulness to the Lord, and he goes on and says, and they speak, that means other churches in the region, speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus. You see, other people knew they had a reputation for longing to see Jesus. They talk about how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. You know, one, another reason why we long for heaven is this, that as God's people, we belong there. And we lose sight of this fact you know, Paul tells the Philippians this. He says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. That's where our citizenship is. 
where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for Him to return as our Savior. You remember that Paul, Paul had a, an exclusive citizenship here on earth. He was born a Roman citizen. And he used that for his benefit on many occasions. But now he's saying, my citizenship is in heaven. He says, my Roman citizenship has no value eternally. My citizenship is in heaven. And then we go to Hebrews, and we're talking about the people who have followed God long ago. And he said, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. They were citizens of heaven. He goes on to say this. He says, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. They belong to nations, different places, but they recognize that their citizenship was not here anymore. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. They're looking for a better place. A heavenly homeland. You realize that God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? Because they long for Him. When we long for Him, God's not ashamed to call us His own. The longing for him. Another reason why we long for heaven is that our bodies will be changed there. Can I hear a little hallelujah? Yeah. Paul says this to the Philippians. He says, God will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. If you want to read, read in Thessalonians, he'll explain even more about how these bodies are changed. I think it's Thessalonians or Corinthians, but one of those two. It just skips my mind right this moment. He also says this, and this is in Corinthians. He says, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, made for us by God Himself, not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. You know, our, our fellowship is riddled with bodies that struggle. We've had surgeries recently. We have people that aren't here because of surgeries recently. We have surgeries coming up this next week. Bodies that long to be replaced. Another reason we long for heaven is this, our priceless inheritance. I didn't put this up on the screen it's a little bit lengthy, but I want to just read to you what Paul says about this, or what Peter says about this in First uh, Peter. He says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance. 
an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Doesn't that sound like what Jesus says, right? So this is decades later, Peter's writing this to us, reminding us of Jesus' words about our treasures being in heaven. And through your faith, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is a wonderful joy ahead even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love Him even though you've never seen Him. Though you do not see Him now, you trust Him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when He told them in advance about Christ's suffering and His great glory afterward. They were told that their their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now, you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the Scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. So after that, we really see a warning that comes. And Paul, in talking to Timothy in his last letter, he says this. He says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. Right? That's what we've been talking about. There will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Yeah. He goes on to say this. He says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Does that sound familiar? And so, we come back to what Jesus is telling us. These are the things that are precluding His coming. These are things, normal things, 
that Scripture has told us will be. And now we see them. And we listen to what Jesus says, and He says, don't be anxious about these things. But when you see them, recognize the times. That your longing be for Me. That in all that we do and all the blessings, all the satisfaction we may get here on earth, that there's a longing in our heart for something more. A longing in our heart for something that is not yet, but will come. So we end with some words of encouragement. Paul tells the Thessalonian church, Over in Thessalonica, he says, Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when He returns, we can live with Him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Jesus is coming back. We have a homeland. We get to go home. Our mission here on earth. You know, Jesus says, you know, even the soldiers, soldiers don't get involved in in civilian affairs. They're trying to please their commanding officer. And one of these days, our mission here will be over and we get to go home. He goes on to say this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with Him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet Him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. I want to go back to a verse that we started with. Paul says to Timothy, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not just to me. Not to me only, but also to all who have loved God. 